Well, McClellan, when the preliminary proclamation is issued, McClellan issues a statement to his troops in which he says, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to abide by this because, you know, civilian control, but actually it's a terrible idea and those who oppose it should find their remedy at the polls. In other words, people should go out and vote for the Democrats, is what he's saying, in order to prevent the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation from finally going into effect. And that, in a sense, is one little indication of how this preliminary proclamation will become a major issue in the fall 1862 election campaign. Um, the, uh, uh, the Democrats will use every racist charge under the sun that, you know, that the, the North is going to get flooded with emancipated slaves, they're going to take your jobs, they're going to marry your daughters, Lincoln is unleashing a tremendous, you know, flood of people into the North, and this has an effect. The Democrats make sizable gains in the fall elections. The Republicans maintain their majority in Congress, but it's much reduced, and um, some people feel that Lincoln is not going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation as a result of this. Nobody knows what is going to happen. One other factor that I should talk about briefly in this whole picture is Civil War diplomacy. Because the Confederacy from the very beginning made a big effort to try to get Britain, particularly Britain, to recognize its independence, to intervene on its side. Now, of course, Britain had abolished slavery in 1833 and was, you know, the public opinion in Britain was anti-slavery by this point. But as long as the war is about the Union, um, the British see it as just a question of local self-determination. If the North is not fighting to get rid of slavery, why should Britain worry about this? Britain, as we have said, is very dependent on southern cotton for its industrial, you know, industrial establishment in Lancashire, the cotton factories up there. Um, and it's remarkable how much pro-Confederate sentiment there was in Great Britain among politicians, among professors at Oxford and Cambridge, among ministers, journalists. Um, many of them would like to be, see the United States knock down a peg or two. Um, many of them didn't like democracy and they thought the, you know, it would weaken democracy in the world if the United States were broken in two. Um, there was still, there was a lot of anti-Confederate anti or pro-Union sentiment too. Uh, working class organizations, labor organizations were very pro-Union, very anti-slavery. With British public opinion divided, the government of um, Lord Palmerston, the, um, the prime minister, was pretty immobilized. I mean, we know now, we know now that there was never a chance Britain was going to intervene on the side of the Confederacy. Britain's position basically was, you guys go and win the war, and then we'll give you all the help you need. Once the war is over, we're on your side, man. But they weren't going to intervene. Um, uh, other than that, it would split the cabinet, it would split the country, um, and um, they were worried about Canada. William Seward kept ranting on about, if, yeah, come on, Britain, come on, come on, let's go and fight. You want to fight, you know, remember George W. Bush? Bring them on, bring them on. Come on, Britain, you want to fight? We're going to invade Canada. This is crazy. They're already fighting one war here. But the British, you know, this, this uh, Seward is crazy. And Charles Francis Adams, the ambassador in England, said, yeah, you know, Seward is really crazy. I don't know what he's talking about, but you guys better really not do anything to provoke him, you know? <laughs> so, um, so basically, Nothing happened. The, the crisis came in 1862. Some people think the proclamation was also aimed at, in part, at deterring British intervention, particularly because in late 1862, Napoleon III, the Emperor of France, proposed European mediation, that the European countries should get together and offer to mediate the war that I mean, it's sort of like, you know, nowadays people talk about humanitarian intervention, right? There was so much bloodshed by this point. Let other countries try to do something to stop, like going on in Syria. Of course, nothing is happening except the war is going on, but there are many people who think somehow the international community should intervene in some way, not sending troops exactly, but some way to stop this bloodshed. Well, Napole now, Napoleon III had his eye on Mexico, and indeed, 
the French were scheming in Mexico all during the Civil War. But um, um, the British had to decide whether to join up with this. And um, eventually, but see, the, the idea, the, the South would accept this. The North would not. And then the plan was, well, if, if one side accepts it and the other doesn't, we will recognize the Confederacy if the North refuses to allow European mediation. But interestingly, in terms of what's going on right today, the European power most friendly to the United States was Russia. Russia refused to join up in this European mediation plan. Why? Well, one reason, you know, the Tsar Alexander had emancipated the serfs of Russia in 1861, had decreed the emancipation of the serfs. Now, serfdom is not the same thing as slavery. That's the subject of a whole other lecture. But nonetheless, it was a quite a remarkable step in the general abolition of servile labor in the 19th century. So there was a sympathy there for the Union on the slavery issue, but also maybe more pragmatically, and Russians seem to be pragmatic also, um, they didn't want, they thought the United States was an antidote to British power. You know, but Europe always worked then as the balance of power and diplomacy. And they thought a strong United States was an antidote to Britain being supreme in the Atlantic world, on the seas, et cetera. And they didn't want to see the United States broken up. So with Russia refusing to go along, with the British cabinet divided, and with Lincoln having issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, the European intervention story uh, collapsed. So it's not going to happen during the war. So finally, on after those elections, um, one last time in early December, Lincoln puts forward again his old plan. Lincoln's message to Congress, I talk about this in my book, of early December 1862 is very bizarre because he resurrects once more his plan of compensation, gradualism, colonization. But he also, you know, says the very famous lines, you know, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress will be, and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. He doesn't mention the Emancipation Proclamation, but in giving freedom to the slave, that's his, you know, kind of look to the future, even though he's still promoting this old this old plan.